Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, happy Sabbath for, ever, for those where it is Sabbath and those that it's going to be Sabbath. And um, I'm at a new location here, so I got a different backdrop, you may notice. Um, that's a virtual backdrop. Eventually, I'll get a real one. But um, anyway, we're going to continue this study on the third angel's messages of righteousness by faith from A.T. Jones, 1895 General Conference Bulletin. But uh, before we begin, uh, we're going to have a word of prayer, and uh, we're going to pray for Brother Toby. Uh, since he's lost, lost his wife, it's difficult. And, um, and we know there's many other people in the movement who are facing trials in various ways, and uh, that God is still speaking to and working with, and... Uh, they definitely need uh, our prayers, and I've prayed for Brother Toby on several occasions, but it's good to uh, be reminded about the needs that others have. So before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful that we have this time together and where we can reflect upon the messages that were given in the past and that still affect us today, that speak to us. And we're thankful, Lord, for the individuals that you have brought into this movement from those that are prominent and even the lowliest member. We know, Lord, that each soul is precious. Help us, Lord, to care for uh, those around us, even those that we feel um, uh, that we have conflicts with in some way, differences, uh, we pray, Lord, that we can represent you. We pray for Brother Toby. We know his trial is something that none of us wish to have. Uh, to lose a spouse is very, very difficult, um, especially when you're older. There's so many years spent together and lives that are interdependent. And we know, Lord, that that change uh, can be very difficult to address. And so we pray for him that your Holy Spirit can comfort him and that um, he can draw close to you. Be with us now, Lord, in this study. Help us in understanding these things, to apply them to our lives and to recognize the work that you are doing. We pray this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good evening again, everyone. And uh, at this time of year, of course, the Sabbath begins late here. Um, be about three hours. But uh, happy Sabbath. And um, here we are on message number 13. The Third Angel's Message, uh, A.T. Jones, and I believe this is presentation number 54. So, I mean, that means we've been studying this for a while because we've been doing it on Friday nights. So it would have begun a year ago or so. I'm not sure the exact date we began these studies. Now, yesterday, um, after we had read through Jones' um, presentation number 12, we discussed a little bit uh, regarding the baptismal vows and Parminder's views, um, his erroneous views on the nature of Christ and how that affects us. And when it comes to, you know, Jones, the thing that I like about A.T. Jones is that he works hard to be very clear. He's very thorough. But people are still able to take his words and twist them when they do not have a desire to know the truth. And, and so people can read A.T. Jones and believe very differently uh, than what he plainly says. And it's something that we have to be cautious about when we read, that we're searching for truth, that we're willing to be examined by the Holy Spirit, to be corrected and that we accept the consequences of what it means 
uh, to believe the truth. And so we know that no matter how well we explain ourselves, people can take what we say and twist it. And that's happened in Adventism. Um, anybody who talks about overcoming sin and the final generation, the 144,000 having the character of Christ, uh, this is considered last generation theology. It's a epithet that definitely has negative connotations to those who use that terminology. But this is really just simply righteousness by faith. It's the gospel. So Jones in this series right now, he's moving into addressing the nature of Christ. And as you know, he's if you've been watching the other studies, he dealt with Hebrews chapter 1, that Jesus is God. And then Hebrews chapter 2, that Jesus is man. And being God and man, he can unite God and man in us when we're in Christ. Anyway, we're going to begin reading here. And anybody who wants to comment or has something that's not clear or has a point to make, feel free to do so. Um, and especially if there's something that you think that I'm missing um, in, in an explanation that I make or something that you just think um, uh, needs to be cleared up even in your own mind. <clears throat> so Jones begins, the particular thought which will be the subject of our study at this time is that which is found in the 11th verse, second chapter of Hebrews, both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. It is men of this world, sinful men whom Christ sanctifies. He is the sanctifier and he and these are all of one. In this part of the chapter, you will remember we are studying man, in the first chapter, as we have seen, there is shown the contrast between Christ and the angels, with Christ above the angels as God. In the second chapter, the contrast is between Christ and the angels, with Christ below the angels. God has not put in subjection to the angels the world to come, whereof we speak. He hath put it in subjection to man, and Christ is the man. Therefore, Christ became man. He takes the place of man. He was born as man is born. In his human nature, Christ came from the man from whom we all have come. So that the expression in this verse, all of one, is the same as all from one, as all coming forth from one. One man is the source and head of all our human nature. And the genealogy of Christ as one of us, runs to Adam. So he then gives a reference to Luke 3, 38. It is true that all men and all things are from God, but the thought in this chapter is man and Christ as man. We are the sons of the first man and so is Christ according to the flesh. We are now studying Christ in his human nature. The first chapter of Hebrews is Christ in his divine nature. The second chapter is Christ in his human nature. The thought in these two chapters is clearly akin to that of the second chapter of Philippians verses five and eight. Uh, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, just, just a comment here. Um, so one of the things about this verse is it's progressive. Right. And, it, and it's talking about the mind of Christ. So what his attitude, what kind of character he had. So even though he was God and it wasn't wrong for him uh, to consider himself as equal with God, he actually came and took, made himself of no reputation. Right. So he he lowered himself and he took the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. 
and he's also being found as fashion as a man. He, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And one of the, th the problems that people who uh, believe that Jesus had the nature of Adam before Adam fell have no explanation of how Jesus could die um, at all if he had a sinless nature because he never sinned. And the reason why he could die is because he took a nature that was subject to death. And, and that would be a fallen nature. But anyway, that's just a thought here. And oh, and the other point was made in the likeness of men. Some people take that word likeness mean meaning uh, to mean the opposite, to mean unlike men, right? Because they say, well, it's like, so that means not the same, right? But that's not really what the word would mean. When something's in the likeness of something, it's like it. It's not unlike it. Anyway, Jones goes on. In that passage, Christ in the two forms is set forth. First, being in the form of God, he took the form of man. In Hebrews first chapter, two chapters, it is not the form, but the nature, right? So sometimes we see this word form, sometimes the word nature. I repeat, in the second chapter of Philippians, we have Christ in the two forms, the form of God and the form of man. In Hebrews first and check, second chapters, we have Christ in the two natures, the nature of God and the nature of man. You may have something in the form of man that would not be of the nature of man. And you can have a piece of stone in the form of man, but it is not the nature of man. Jesus Christ took the form of man. That is true. And he did more. He took the nature of man. Let us read now the 14th verse of the second chapter of Hebrews. For as much then as the children, he says the children of Adam, the human race, are partakers of flesh and blood, he, Christ, also himself, likewise took part of the same. Likewise means in this wise, in this way, in a way like this, which is spoken of. Therefore, Christ took, took flesh and blood in a way we take it. But how did we take flesh and blood? By birth, and clear from Adam too. He took flesh and blood by birth also and clear from Adam too. For it is written, he is the seed of David, according to the flesh, Romans 1 verse 3. While David calls himself Lord, he also is David's son, Matthew 22, 42, and 45. His genealogy is traced to David, but it does not stop there. It goes to Abraham because he is the seed of Abraham. He took on him the seed of Abraham, as in the 16th verse of this second chapter of Hebrews. Nor does his genealogy stop with Abraham. It goes to Adam, Luke 3, 38. Therefore, he which sanctifieth among men and they who are sanctified among men are all of one, all coming from one man according to the flesh and all of one. Thus, on the human side, Christ's nature is precisely our nature. Let us look at the other side again for an illustration of this oneness, that we may see the force of this expression, that he and we are all of one. On the other side, however, as in the first chapter of Hebrews, he is of the nature of God. The name God, which he bears, belongs to him by the very fact of his existence. It belongs to him by inheritance as that name belongs to him entirely because he exists and as certainly as he exists and as it belongs to him by nature. It is certain that his nature is the nature of God. Also in the first chapter of John, first verse, it is written, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. That word with does not express the reality of the thought as well as another. Uh, the German puts a word in there that defines the Greek closer than ours does. That says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was, I don't know how you pronounce the German word here, B.A. God. Literally, the word was of God. And that is true. Uh, the Greek word conveys the same idea as that my right arm is of me, of my body. The Greek, therefore, 
is literally, in the beginning, the word was God. This simply illustrates on that side the fact as to what he is on this side. For as on the divine side, he was of God, of the nature of God, and was really God. So on the human side, he is of man and of the nature of man and really man. <clears throat> Look at the 14th verse of the first chapter of John. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That tells the same story that we are reading here in the first two chapters of Hebrews. In the beginning was the word, and the word was of God, and the word was God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, flesh and blood as ours is. Now, what kind of flesh is it? What kind of flesh alone is it that this world knows? Just such flesh as you and I have. This world does not know any other flesh of man and has not known any other since the necessity for Christ's coming was created. Therefore, as this world knows only such flesh as we have, as it is now, it is certainly true that when the word was made flesh, he was just as flesh as ours is. It cannot be otherwise. Now, remember, we yesterday we looked at Parminder's uh, baptismal vows, where he said that Christ came in a sinful human body. And the reason why he chose, okay, I, I can ask it as a question. Why would he chose the word body over the word flesh? Why didn't he just say Jesus came in a sinful human flesh? I mean, he could have used nature too, but he chose not to use that. But, but he chose body instead of flesh. Now, why did he do that? I'm asking you to read Parminder's mind, but if you think about what he was trying to do, why did he choose body and not flesh? Because he, he, had, he had defined our nature as, as, as just the body, right? So we have a body, a physical body, and that body is, is not the problem, according to Parminder, right? Well, flesh is more descriptive, you say flesh. Yeah, well, actually, if you look at the Greek, that where they translate flesh, and often translated as sinful flesh, uh, it's just the word sarx. That's the Greek word. And it refers to a sinful human nature, right? So the idea of flesh and spirit are complete contrasts. And, and Parminder believed that that was a type of dualism, and he wanted to avoid that. Um, so he has some weird ideas, which I don't even fully understand why he, where he gets these ideas from. But by giving Christ a, a human, a sinful body, he's 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 avoiding this whole sinful nature issue because he doesn't want to believe that Jesus had a sinful human nature. So it, it it's it's a rather Jesus being tempted shows that he had a sinful nature. Yeah, well, when you look at how Parminder tried to address being tempted from the body, right? So, because if you believe that we are, we we are, we have a sinful human nature in the sense that that is our nature as man, then um, in Parminder's thinking, that would mean that we could not be saved because he doesn't believe that the sinful nature can be saved. He believes that our spirit has to be saved. Right? Do you understand what I'm saying? It, it, it doesn't really make any sense. So it's kind of hard to explain something that doesn't make sense. Uh, but the I'm idea is... So yeah. He's trying to separate. separate. Right. So, because he doesn't really believe that we're sinners in the way that um, that we believe that we're sinners. Because he thinks not sinning is easy. He said, you know, 
all you have to do is be nice and anybody can be nice. And, and that's not true. I mean, that it's not true on either count. One is sinning is not just not being nice. Sin is the transgression of the law. It's, it's the enmity, right? And we contain this enmity in our flesh. But yet God is going to save us. And Christ came in that same flesh. So he avoids the whole gospel uh, with his, his focus upon the word body. But anyway, um, it's clear here that the word was made flesh, sarx, which is referring to the nature. So Joan says he was made just as flesh as ours is. It cannot be otherwise. Again, what kind of flesh is our flesh as it is in itself? Let us turn to the eighth chapter of Romans and read whether Christ's human nature meets ours and is as ours in that respect, wherein ours is sinful flesh. Romans 8, 3. What the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son did. There was something that the law could not do and that God sending his own son did. But why was it that the law, what was it that the law could not do, that it desired and what was required? It was weak through the flesh. The trouble was in the flesh. It was this that caused the law to fail of its purpose concerning man. Then God sent Christ to do what the law could not do. And the law, having failed of its purpose because of the flesh, not because of any lack in itself, God must send him to help the flesh and not to help the law. If the law had been in itself too weak to do what it was intended to do, then the thing for him to have done to help the matter out would be to remedy the law. But the trouble was with the flesh, and therefore he must remedy the flesh. It is true that the argument nowadays springing up from that enmity that it is against God and is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, is that the law could not do what was intended, and God sent his son to weaken the law so that the flesh could answer the demands of the law, right? So this would be, you just lower the standard because the law, the standard of the law was too high. That's what people really believe. And so what God has to do is lower the standard so that we can meet it, right? Now, they call that grace, but in their idea, grace is weakening the law so that we're not we're not subject to law in the sense that we now the law has been weakened so that it doesn't condemn us anymore right would that be the generally the idea that many in the christian world have so you can still keep sinning but be saved and that's a weakening of the law yeah, that's what generally, yeah, generally what they believe. But what we need is something that can help the flesh overcome so that it can meet the demands of the law. So Jones goes on, he says, but if I am weak and you are strong and I need help, it does not help me any to make you as weak as I am. I am as weak and helpless as before. There is no help at all in that. But when I am weak and you are strong and you can bring to me your strength, that helps me. So the law was strong enough, but its purpose could not be accomplished through the weakness of the flesh. Therefore, God, to supply the need, must bring strength to weak flesh. He sent Christ to supply the need, and therefore Christ must so arrange it that strength may be brought to our flesh itself, which we have today, that the purpose of the law, the, the law may be met in our flesh. So it is written, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh in order that the righteousness of, of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now, do not get a wrong idea of what that word of that word likeness. It is not the shape. It is not the photograph. It is not the likeness in the sense of an image, but it is likeness in the sense of being like indeed 
The word likeness here is not the thought that is in the second chapter of Philippians where it is shape or form. But the shape, it's shape, the form or likeness as to form. But here in the book of Hebrews, it is likeness in nature. Likeness to the flesh as it is in itself. God sending his own son in that which is just like sinful flesh. And in order to be just like sinful flesh, it would have to be sinful flesh in order to be made flesh at all, as it is in this world. He would have to be just such flesh as it is in this world, just such as we have, and that is sinful flesh. That this is what is said in the words, likeness of sinful flesh. This is shown in the ninth and 10th verses of Hebrews 2 also. We see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. Not only as man was made lower than the angels when he was created. Man was sinless when God made him a little lower than the angels. That was sinless flesh. But man fell from that place and condition and became sinful flesh. Now we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. But not as man was made when he was first made a little lower than the angels. But as man is since he sinned and became still lower than the angels. That is where we see Jesus. Let us read and see. We see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels. What for? For the suffering of death. Then Christ being made as much lower than the angels as man is. Is as much lower than the angels as man is since he sinned and became subject to death. We see him crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, should taste death, death for every man. For it became him, it was appropriate for him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Therefore, as he became subject to suffering and death, this demonstrates strongly enough that the point lower than the angels at which Christ came to stand, where he does stand and where we see him, is the point to which man, when he in sin, stepped still lower than where God made him, even then a little lower than the angels. Again, the 16th verse. Verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. He took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the nature of Abraham. But the nature of Abraham and of the seed of Abraham is only human nature. Again, wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. In how many things? All things. Then in his human nature, there is not a particle of difference between him and you. Let us read the scripture. Let us study this closely. I want to see that we shall stand by it. Let us read it over. All are all of one. He took part of flesh and blood in the same way that we take part of flesh and blood. He took not of the nature, not the nature of angels, but the seed, the nature of Abraham. Wherefore, for these reasons, it behooved him. What is behooved? It was the proper thing for him to do. It became him. It was appropriate. It behooved him to be made in all things like unto his brethren. Who are his brethren, though? The human race, all of one. And for this cause, he is not ashamed to call them brethren, because we are all of one. He is not ashamed to call you and me brethren. Wherefore, in all things, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. Well, then, in his human nature... When he was upon the earth, was he in any wise different from what you are in your human nature tonight? A few in the congregation responded, no. I wish I had heard everybody in the house say no with a loud voice. We had heard everybody. Um, um, you are too timid altogether. The word of God says that. And we are to say that is so, because there is salvation in just that one thing. No, it is not enough to say it that way. The salvation 
of God for human being beings lies in just that one thing. We are not to be timid about it at all. There our salvation lies. And until we get there, we are not sure of our salvation. That is where it is. In all things, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. What for? Oh, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in all th in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people, for that he hath he himself hath suffered, being tempted, he is able to succor or to help them that are tempted. Then don't you see that our salvation lies just there? Do you not see that it is right there where Christ comes to us? He came to us just where we are tempted and was made like us just where we are tempted. And there's the point where we meet him, the living Savior, against the power of temptation. Now, the 14th verse of the fourth chapter of Hebrews. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was on all points tempted like as we are. He could not have been tempted in all points like as I am, if he were not in all points like as I am to start with. Therefore, it behooved him to be made in all points like me. If he is going to help me where I need help, I know that right there is where I need it. And oh, I know it is right there where I get it. Thank the Lord. There is where Christ stands, and there is my help. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched. Two negatives there. Have not a high priest which cannot be touched. Then what do we have on the affirmative side? We have a high priest who can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. My infirmities, your infirmities, our infirmities. Does he feel my infirmities? Yes. Does he feel your infirmities? Yes. What is an infirmity? It's a weakness, a wavering weakness. That is expressive enough. We have many of them. All of us have many of them. We feel our weaknesses. Thank the Lord, there is one who feels them also. Yea, not only feels them, but is touched with the feeling of them. There is more in that word touched than simply that he is reached with the feeling of our weaknesses and feels as we feel. He feels as we feel, that is true. But beyond that, he is touched. That is, he is tenderly affected. His sympathy is stirred. He is touched to tenderness and affected to sympathy and he helps us. This is what is said in the words, touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Thank the Lord for such a savior. But I say again, we cannot be tempted in all points like as I am, unless he was in all points like I am to start with. He could not feel as I do unless he is where I am and as I am. In other words, he could not be tempted in all points as I, I am and feel as I feel unless he was just myself over again. The word of God says in all points like as we are. Let us study this further. There are things that will tempt you strongly, that will draw hard on you, that are no more to me than a zephyr on a summer, summer day. Something will draw hard on me even to my overthrowing. And that that would not affect you at all. What strongly tempts one may not affect another. Then, in order to help me, Jesus must be where he can feel what I feel and be tempted in all points where I could be tempted with any power at all. What strongly tempts one may not affect another. Then, in order to help me, Jesus must be where he can feel what I feel and be tempted in all points where I could be tempted with any power at all. But as things that tempt me may not affect you at all, and things that affect you may not affect me, Christ has to stand where you and I both are, so as to meet all the temptations of both. Uh, we must feel all those which, um, 
all those which you meet that do not affect me, and also those which I meet that do not affect you. He has to take the place of both of us. That is so. Then there is the other man. Then there are things that tempt him to his overthrow that do not affect you or me either. Then Jesus had to take all the feelings and nature of myself, of yourself, and of the other man also, so that he could be tempted in all points like as I am, and in all points like as you are, and in all points like as the other man is. But when you and I and the other man are taken to, in him, how many does that embrace? It takes the whole human race. And this is exactly the truth. Christ was in the place and he had the nature of the whole human race. And in him meet all the weaknesses of mankind so that every man on earth who can be tempted at all finds in Jesus Christ power against temptation. For every soul there is in Jesus Christ, um, there is in Jesus Christ victory against all temptation and relief from the power of it. That is the truth. Now, this word victory, I mean, the one of the things um, is this, this word isn't very common in our theological vocabulary anymore, vocabulary anymore. Christ, we may say that he is the victor and he is victorious, but he is saying that we can be victorious. In every soul, there is, in Jesus Christ, victory against all temptation and relief from the power of it. That is the truth. Let us look at it from another side. There's one in the world, Satan, the God of this world, who is interested in seeing that we are tempted just as much as possible. But he does not have to employ much of his time or very much of his power in temptation to get us to yield. The same one was here, and he was particularly interested in getting Jesus to yield to temptation. He tried Jesus upon every point upon which he would ever have to try me to get me to sin, and he tried in vain. He utterly failed to get Jesus to consent to sin in any single point upon which I can ever be tempted. He also tried Jesus upon every point upon which he has ever tried you or ever can try you to get you to sin, and he utterly failed there too. And that takes you and me both then. And Jesus has conquered in all points for both you and me. But when he tried Jesus upon all points that he has, he has tried upon both you and me and failed there, as he did completely fail, he had to try him more than that yet. He had to try him upon all the points upon which he has tried the other man to get him to yield. Satan did this also and there completely failed. Thus Satan had to try. And he did try Jesus upon all the points that he ever had to try me upon and upon all the points that he ever had to try you upon and also upon all the points that he would have to try the other man upon. Consequently, he had to try Jesus upon every point upon which it is possible for temptation to rise in any man of the human race. Satan is the author of all temptation. And he had to try Jesus upon every point upon which it is possible for Satan himself to raise the temptation. And all he and in all, he failed all the time. Thank the Lord. More than that, Satan not only had to try Jesus upon all the points where he has ever had to try me, and he had to try Jesus with a good deal more power than he ever had to exert upon me. He never had to try very hard nor use very much of his power in temptation to get me to yield. But taking the same points upon which Satan has ever tried me, which he got me to sin or would ever have to try to get me to sin. He had to try Jesus on those same points a good deal harder than he ever did to get me to sin. And he had to try him with all the power of temptation that he possibly knows, that is the devil, I mean, and failed. Thank the Lord. So in Christ, I am free. He had to try Jesus in all points where he ever tempted or ever can tempt you. And he had to try him with all the power that he knows and failed again. Thank the Lord. So you are free in Christ. And he also had to try Jesus upon every point that affects the other man with all his satanic power also. And still he failed. Thank the Lord. And in Christ, the other man is free. Therefore, he had to try Jesus upon every point that ever the human 
could be tried upon and failed. And he had to try Jesus with all the knowledge that he has and all the cunning that he knows and failed. And he had to try Jesus with all his might upon each particular point, and still he failed. Then there is a threefold, yes, a complete failure on the devil's part all around. In the presence of Christ, Satan is absolutely conquered. And in Christ, we are conquerors of Satan. Jesus said, the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. In Christ, then, we escape him. In Christ, we meet in Satan, a completely conquered and a completely exhausted enemy. This is not to say that we have no more fighting to do, but it is to say, and to say emphatically and joyfully, that in Christ, we fight the fight of victory. Out of Christ, we fight, but it is all defeat. In him, our victory is complete, as well as in all things in him, we are complete. But oh, do not forget the expression, it is in him. Then as Satan has exhausted all the temptations that he knows or possibly can know, and has exhausted all his power in the temptation too, what is he? In the presence of Christ, what is he? Powerless. And when he finds us in Christ and then would reach us and harass us, what is he? Powerless. Praise and magnify the Lord. Let us rejoice in this, for in him we are victors. In him we are free. In him Satan is powerless towards us. Let us be thankful for that. In him we are complete. So I don't think Jones could have been any more clear in expounding upon that verse than he has. I don't think there would be a possible way. Uh, but we should be able to see this and, and not just see it intellectually, but we should be able to experience this, that we can go to Christ and know that he can give us this victory over whatever temptation is around. And, and often we think of temptation as those things, you know, that um, that come to our imagination and and the fantasy world that we live, we try to escape from this painful world. There's all the, the pleasures of this world. But often the things that we need to be victorious are over are the things in our character that really are the root of all of these other sins, the pride, the jealousy, the envy. Right, self-preservation. And sometimes people can feel that they're victorious, that they're Christians, because they don't do a lot of those bad things that other people do. You know, they fast twice in the week, and pay tithe of all they possess, and they're not like that publican, right? And, and so what we need as sinners is we need to see the work of Satan in our lives. We need to see what Satan has done. We need to see our nature. And, you know, and of course, we, we try to blame Satan for it. You know, the devil made me do it. But the reality is uh, we did it because we have a sinful human nature and we chose not to be victorious. Satan may have tempted us, but he can't make us sin, right? The devil can't make us do it. We are totally free moral agents to decide to choose. And so this to me is a very powerful presentation of Jones. A little bit wordy, but a little bit, you know, lots of repetition, but I think it needed to be done. Any final thoughts on this? Because I'm worn out. Jeff, you had a thought? Uh, I did, but I lost it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't want to lose these thoughts. You know, what, what God wants to do, I mean, is it, the work of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. 
And so often what we think that we need to do is to somehow prove that we are good or better than others. I mean, this is a powerful message that this movement needs, that this church needs. About a, you know, it's about a new nature, receiving a new nature, you know. Well, we, you know, we still always have a sinful nature. So, you know, we're not yeah, going to have the nature it's removed. It's a daily, uh, you know, sanctification. And, uh, yeah, what, what we need is the mind of Christ, because Christ had a sinful human nature. His nature never changed. He didn't. He wasn't obedient to God because he had a, a nature that was sinless. Yeah. Well, I mean, we talked about the sinlessness of the human nature of Christ. Ellen White talks about we should have no misgivings in regard to the sinfulness of the sinlessness of the human nature of Christ. People take that statement out of its context to say, well, see, he had a sinless. There's his nature was sinless, right? Because she talks about the sinlessness. But what she's talking about is, is the fact that Christ had sinful human nature, but was still sinless. That is, he didn't sin. Right. So that's what she means, that we should have no misgivings in regard to the sinlessness of the human nature of Christ. And but people can take all of what Ellen White says and just take this one statement and twist it to their purpose and just ignore all the flat out statements that Jesus had the same nature that you and I had, that he had a fallen human nature. He had the nature of Adam, he had the nature of David. He had the nature of Adam after he fell. He had the nature of Abraham, which is definitely sinful nature. And so we have a sinful nature and God's not gonna give us a sinless nature. He's not gonna remove the ability to sin so that we can no longer sin. He has to give us the same power that Christ had. Righteous. We're still gonna, yeah, we're still gonna be tempted. We're still gonna be tempted like Christ. Yeah, Christ was tempted, right? We're still gonna be tempted. Be tempted. See, when somebody says, you know, I'm not even tempted anymore, I mean, you can see what self-deception a person is in when they say that. Yeah. Yep. Right. Because Jesus could never say that. No. <laughs> right? Now, some people say, well, you know, what do you mean by tempted? You know, was he tempted to commit adultery and all these different things? And they try to mock it up a little bit, you know, like Jesus was. But the thing is, the temptations came to him. He just never entertained them with his mind because his mind was the mind of Christ. His flesh was the same flesh that you and I have. All the same, same temptations came to him through the flesh. But his mind was victorious. And Jones is going to go into that and explain about the mind. Anyway, um, so Dwight's going to present tomorrow morning. And uh, hopefully I get a really good sleep and I can concentrate. Um, but anyway, we ask... Uh, that uh, you pray for one another again. Um, keep each other in prayer. Keep the camp meeting in prayer. And, and keep yourself in prayer. Because each one of us is facing trials that, that we're unprepared for if we're not connected with Christ. So let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the time that we've had here this evening little bit shorter than usual, but a very powerful message. And Lord, we need you. Every moment of every day, we need to see our need of you. And we need to call upon you uh, to overcome. We have to be prepared for those things that we're not prepared for. And so we need to be connected with you. Thank you for the work of Jesus in coming and bearing temptation in our flesh and being victorious. Help us to keep this in mind as we focus not upon our sins, but upon what Christ has done for us. Help us to see our need and to trust in him. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen.